This is All India Radio. In the special program, now we bring you an exclusive interview with Professor P. P. Divakaran, an academician and researcher in the field of mathematical tradition of India on the history of Indian mathematics. Namaskar and welcome. We have with us an eminent scholar, Professor P. P. Divakaran, a retired professor from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, who has been associated with several institutions across India, including the Inter University Centre for Astronomy and Astrophysics in Pune. He is an adjunct professor at the Chennai Mathematical Institute and was conferred with a senior award of the Homi Bhabha Fellowships Council. Interestingly, he has researched the rich history of India's mathematical heritage and published a book, The Mathematics of India: Concepts, Methods, Connections, in 2018. Let's now delve into the world of India's mathematical tradition and its outstanding contributions to the world with him. Welcome professor to the show. Since you are an academician from the field of physics, tell us what got you interested in the history of Indian mathematics. Well, of course, to all such questions, they don't have simple answers. But uh, you know, I'm not a mathematician by profession. I'm a physicist, but I'm a mathematical physicist, and I have always been interested in mathematics. But then, what really happened was that uh, after I retired, during the time I was spending in Chennai, I discovered that a very, very distinguished historian of mathematics of Kerala. Dr. K. V. Sharma was actually a neighbor within walking distance of where I was staying, and uh, I happened to have been introduced to him by a common friend. And I found him absolutely the finest kind of scholar we have in mind when we talk of Indian scholarship. He was very welcoming, so um, I got, got into the habit of going there, and I learned a lot of things from him. So he asked me, "Do you want to read this book?" I said, "Yes, I would like to." Then he said, "Why don't you try it in Malayalam?" So that's how I got interested in the subject. and i dipped into it for over a year and i discovered that it was actually a treasure house it was full of wonderful things that is how i got interested in the subject india has an exceptional mathematical heritage it gave to the world geniuses like aryabhatta and ramagupta tell us why did 14th century mathematician madhav of sangamagram catch your attention that is a straightforward answer in the sense that you know india has a long tradition of mathematical activity you know as a, an old documentary was titled It has extended from the Indus Valley to Indira Gandhi. Uh, many famous names: Aryabhatta, first of all, the greatest of them all. Then uh, you mention uh, Brahmagupta. I would add Bhaskar Acharya and several others. And but if you look at uh, accounts of the history of Indian mathematics and Indian astronomy, the two are tied together. Then you find Madhavan's name is often not there. And then you discover that very many people, educated people, people educated in the sciences, for example, had not heard of Madhavan. So when I was reading Yukti Bhasha, it makes it clear that Madhava's work is on a par with Aryabhatta. In fact, I consider them the two great pillars of Indian mathematics. So that is how I got interested. You know, the two of them, Aryabhatta and Madhava, have a distinction which other Indian mathematicians don't. They created entirely new disciplines of mathematical inquiry. So it is natural that I got interested in Madhava. I wanted to know what actually he did. and where the ideas that he developed came from that is how i got interested secondly i could read yukti bhasha because it is in malayalam uh, sanskrit you know you have to have help from people technical questions arise so there you are that is my answer kerala has a rich history of mathematics for those not aware of this history tell us about the kerala school of mathematics its place and significance in the history of indian mathematics first of all i would request you and to you the listeners Uh, to keep in mind that there is not one Kerala school of mathematics; there are actually two. Madhava lived from, let's say, about 1350, 1360 till about 1420 A.D. In the ninth century, in a different place, uh, what, which is the place which is now called Kudungallur, then known as Mahodayapuram, there was a school of mathematicians and astronomers, of whom we know two names very well. Uh, one is a man called Govinda Swami; the other is his son, whose name is Shankara Narayana. And Shankara Narayana wrote a book called Shankara Narayaniyam, or it is a commentary on one of the works of a person Bhaskar. So it is better to keep that is the first Kerala school. If you like, you call the second one, the next one, the Madhava school, the second Kerala school, or as I prefer to call it, the Nila school. Why the Nila school? Because as most people from Kerala know, it, at that time, the 16th and 17th centuries in particular. And this was a cradle of all of modern Kerala culture, all of it. 
Kunja uh, Teruza Chen was from that area. All the great Kathakali uh, works were written, not there, but under the influence of those people. Other art forms, Ayurveda flourished there, most of all. So I like to call it Nila School, partly because of my bias, partly because of my special knowledge as a Malayali, that uh, this was a very, very special part of Kerala and of India. So that's the reason I call it the Nila School. But why, what is its special place? I think, uh, first of all, who were they? Madhava was the first of the second year in Kerala school. And he had a several, he had one student we know of, who had two students, both his sons and so on and so forth. Here we come to Nilakantha, who was a very, very great person, very, very great man. And in fact, in my view, second only to Madhava in a different way. Nilakantha had a disciple called Jayashtadeva, who then had disciples called Shankarava here and Achilla Kishadri. And that's sort of the end of the Kerala school or the Nila school. Why is it special? It's special because of the continuity. You know, it's very, very unusual to find in ancient times a line of succession of outstandingly good people working in any special area, whether it is Ayurveda in India or mathematics and astronomy in India or mathematics, astronomy, other sciences in later Europe and so on and so forth. So this was a very special thing that happened. The, the real reason why it is special, it is the high point in this long story of mathematics in India, for 3,500, 4,000 year old story. And this also represents intellectually, creatively, the summit of this long story. After that, it died. You say that Madhav articulated principles of calculus centuries before Newton and Leibniz did. What do you base your theory on? Centuries before, of course, is very easy because Madhav lived about 250 years before Newton did, you know, 1350 born. Newton was born in about 1650. So uh, the time, uh, there is no question. I and mean, chronologically, Madhura preceded Newton. So the question is, is it calculus? Yes, it is calculus. And the way to, the proper justification of this claim will require very, very technical issues concerning what calculus is and how it is different from other mathematical disciplines and so on and so forth, that I will not go into. So it's both in concept and method, it is calculus. The proof for that is that the many of the things that are proved in Yukti Vasha, these are all claimed to have been first formulated by Madhava. Many of those things are done in a way which, if I take it from Malayalam prose and turn it into equations, is exactly the way we teach the subject today in schools, in schools and colleges. Exactly the same. Some of them are so similar that I, I have actually uh, uh, translated one particular passage exactly into English prose, then into equations, and then that's exactly what you find in the textbooks. Calculus was applied in Kerala in, uh, by Madhava and his disciple to problems of a very, very specific kind. They're problems which uh, arise in what is called the study of trigonometric functions. Newton and Leibniz, from the beginning, recognized that they are the same methods, exactly the same methods, the unknowingly the same methods, apply to a much larger class of mathematical objects, much larger class of what are called functions. But this is, of course, not a reason for neglecting uh, Madhava's work or rejecting Madhava's work as a calculus, because subsequently, if you see the applications and uses of calculus today in mathematics, Newton and Leibniz would have been astonished. They would not have recognized their own ideas in what's now called calculus. So uh, I think it is perfectly justified, that's my view. I think more and more people agree with me, especially uh, the mathematicians, more and more mathematicians agree with my view. In fact, one of the finest living mathematicians today who is interested in the history of mathematics, in fact, uh, is a good friend of mine and a, and a very, very fine scholar of Indian uh, traditional mathematics. He says, I have no doubt that Madhava belongs alongside Newton and Leibniz. And not exactly the same words, but that is what he has said. So I, it's not just me, a lot of people now think so, that it is calculus. Are there any historical records or evidence that can throw light on Madhav's contributions? You know, Madhava himself uh, wrote uh, very little. I mean, he didn't write it. He only wrote one or two little books, and these are manuals, astronomical manuals. So what we know from Nilakantha's great work, Adyabhatiya Bhashya, in which he gives the credit of almost all of these things to Madhava, he will say, things like Madhava Ditam or Madhava Nirmitam Padyam, and then quote a verse from Madhava. So the impression we have now, at least I have now, is that 
Madhava scattered his wisdom. Whoever was willing to listen to him, and it is the, the its followers who put them all down in uh, well constructed works of uh, technical quality. Nilakantha, but most of all Yukti Basha. So the real source of our information is Yukti Basha. Trouble is, it is in Malayalam. That is a part of the problem. Some mathematicians pointed out that Madhav and members of his school applied geometrical methods to obtain their findings, and that is different from modern methods of calculus. What do you think? Oh, I would not fully agree because uh, it's a technical question. The reason why I would not fully agree is that geometry and other disciplines of mathematics, such as algebra, in India were never separated. They were all mathematical knowledge. Was mathematical knowledge. Uh, they would have special names like. For geometry, or algebra, Chaturvedika, or Bijaganiza, and so on and so forth. But they used uh, algebraic techniques very freely in their geometry, and they used geometry to prove algebraic results. As far as calculus goes, fundamentally, you know, calculus is a subject which concerns itself with the deviations from geometric deviations from straight lines. It's algebraic version, you would say, the functions which are not linear, and the two are intuitively recognized to be. Two aspects of the same question from the beginning in Indian geometry and algebra. In Europe, on the other hand, it be, they became formally joined together in the great uh, work of the great man René Descartes. So when Newton and Leibniz did it, there was there were two ways of looking at it: geometric and algebraic. Because you know you have a geometric figure, a curve, for example, like a circle, and then you will have an algebraic expression of the same geometric fact. You could work with either. But fundamentally, calculus is about non-linear geometry. Listeners, we are in conversation with Professor P. P. Devakaran on the mathematical tradition of India. Professor, it took more than two centuries for Madhav's work to gain recognition. What might be the reasons for this delay to your mind? Yukti Bhasha, the primary source of his work, is written in Malayalam. Can we assume then that language was the barrier that delayed the process? Yeah, I think from a historical point of view, it's a very, very interesting question. I think some of the things that I say are very personal views. They may not be; uh, other people may not agree with me. I think fundamental reason was that the Miller School was largely self-sufficient in the sense that there were no close contacts with other parts of India, and I think there is a reason for that. Apart from the typical Malayali isolationism, which I think is an intellectual fact. There are other reasons. You know, Kerala was never part of an Indian Empire ever. Till you know, it was ruled. It was never ruled by a power based outside Kerala. Till we became independent and the linguistic reorganisation of states took place. So people were very self-sufficient, very autonomous in many ways. So they were quite happy talking to one another. That's enough for them. It is not just. It is not just that it, it did not go out of Kerala. You must remember the villages in which these mathematicians lived. All of them lived together. Were not more than walking distance away one from the other. Through Kandiyur, Aditiyur, through Prangod, then Kodalur, where Madhava himself comes from, according to me, they are all within 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers of one another. So it is a very compact. You know, it's a very special, very esoteric activity. It is not something which they took to the common people. Yukti um, Bhasha is in Malayalam, and that has had a tremendous impact. On the absence of, because Yukti Bhasha is by far the most detailed, the most complete, the most sophisticated account of Madhava's ideas and techniques, and that remained unknown for a very long time. The other part of the answer to your question is when we say remained unknown, was neglected, we mean generally by Westerners, because we are all products of the Western education system. The Westerners didn't know about it till 1830, and that is when Charles Wish. Gave a lecture in London in which he talked about the text that he discovered in uh, near Kochi, I think probably in Kodumallur. So that is uh, why would they be interested? They were a colonizing power. The Europeans, the British were a colonizing power. They would not particularly care for it, even though in the early days of the East India Company, uh, people like Colebrook and even William Jones took an interest in texts on subjects which we now consider to be scientific, but it disappeared. You know, little by little, people didn't know anymore. Kerala was a far corner, you know, it's so far from Calcutta. It wasn't very much part of their, uh, part of their, what shall I say, the, the view of India. That I think is a reasonable. I find that reason satisfactory. Other people don't. Despite such rich historical background on mathematics, what do you think prevented the Kerala school from flourishing? Could colonization have played a role here? 
You know, this is part of the answer is already in my, what I said just a little while ago, that it was, you know, it was an isolated activity. I mean, um, you know, when people were writing, using these mathematics to write books on astronomy, and subsequently to write down uh, rules to be followed by astrologers, then it became, that, that kind of thing was widely known because people were strong believers in astrology. But Mathur's work is really, very really pure mathematics by and large. It's very little application in astronomy. So that would not have appealed to, let's say, you know, Konkan was full of astrologers, the Konkan coast. It would not have appealed to them. So there is that. Uh, then there, as far as the Europeans are concerned, and, you know, you must remember that the beginning of the, I mean, the scientific activity in the modern Europe is a product of the Enlightenment. And that happened at about the same time as colonization started of India by Europeans. You know, the European colonizers arrived in India at the point when the, the Nila School of Mathematics was at pinnacle. Uh, Nila Gantha wrote his other great astronomy text, Pancha Sangraha, two years after Vasco landed near Calicut. So there was, uh, and that destroyed, that destroyed the local support system for these activities. Uh, the Samudris were very busy fighting the first the Portuguese, then the Dutch, then the English. Then the temples lost their rich riches. Irunavaya, for example, very rich temple, or Arati, another rich temple, all in the same area where the mathematicians were. All of them lost their wealth. So that is the reason why. And the Vasco da Gama certainly could not have understood uh, what Mata was doing or what Miragantha was doing. You know, he was just a very class person. It's not like the Jesuits who came later. But even for that, there is very little evidence that the Jesuits actually understood this stuff. There is very little evidence. What kind of response did Madhav's discoveries generate among the international community of mathematicians? And is there an acknowledgement of his contribution? Now, fully. You know, it took a long time. But uh, finally, the international mathematical community, those who are interested, they know that this is, uh, this is very beautiful work, you know. It's not just the calculus part of it, which we have talked about a little while ago. It is also so many other things that Madhava did, which are very, very modern in spirit. That is, which were done in European mathematics substantially later, not because they were not uh, smart enough, but because those problems didn't arise in Europe till then. Do you think there is a lack of acknowledgement when it comes to Indian mathematicians compared to the Western counterparts? I think so, and I think that is also very natural. You know, Europe, as I said, Europe uh, got into the science game or mathematics game, astronomy game, whatever, the, the rational use of the intellect to understand the world better. As a result of the rediscovery of its Greek heritage, the classical Greek heritage, and that played a very big role in the Enlightenment, uh, the Renaissance of intellectual and aesthetic activities in Europe. And they were fully, fully involved in understanding that. So even after the first texts were published from India, like the Colbrook's book on the work of Brahmagupta and Bhaskaracharya um, in the beginning of the 19th century, it took a very long time for them to get involved in it, but they did get involved in it. So the Europeans naturally, there are puzzles, however. There are European mathematicians, mathematical historians who uh, till very late, till the second, first half of the 20th century, uh, would still not accept, would still find it difficult to believe that all of this work arose independently in India. As far as we know, Madhva's work was not influenced by anything from anywhere else, except, of course, his primary source of inspiration, which is Aryabhata, uh, 1,500 kilometers away in Bihar. So, uh, yes, the Europeans tend to favor uh, an interpretation of the history uh, which is Greek-centric. I don't think we should complain about this uh, because the real reason is, uh, the real way to get over this uh, this feeling that some Indians have is to do our own history very well, very rigorously, as well as we can. I think so. Professor, do you think in-depth studies are needed on the mathematical discoveries of the Kerala School of Mathematics? I think so, uh, because for the reason being that, you know, uh, there are hundreds, maybe thousands, of manuscripts uh, lying around. And uh, these manuscripts very often are about the same text, but there are variations in them, there are differences in them. And almost all of them are in Sanskrit, if you are in Malayalam. Of the important ones, only Yukti Vasha is in Malayalam. Everything else is in Sanskrit. 
the amazing thing is that even if I take the main words of the uh, Nila school, only about 10% have a translation. Forget about detailed comments, commentaries, just a plain translation into a language which more people, especially those not from India, can follow. Most of them are in Sanskrit, as I said. The Malayalam text has been translated so uh, into English, so that is now available. So there is tremendous amount of work to be done. It's not only here. I'm sure that the manuscript library in Mysore probably will produce a certain number of texts of this kind. For example, you know, one very interesting manuscript of a standard classic from uh, of Adipatas, in fact, in Adipatiya, was found in the museum in Baroda. Why is it interesting? Because on one sheet there is an inscription in Malayalam. This is how we know. This is how we know the lineage, the genealogy, Madhava to Parameshwara to Nilakantha and so on and so forth. That's in Baroda, and Baroda Museum has many, many manuscripts. Uh, Mysore Manuscript Library has plenty of them. Our own uh, Trivandrum, the old government manuscript library, are part of the, I think, the university system. So there are plenty of things to be done. Just as the work of Madhav and others in his tutelage was lost to modern mathematics until this effort of yours, are there other such works, especially in non-Sanskrit languages, in other parts of India, which may be lost to us? I don't have a good answer for that. I think in the sense that, you know, wherever they were, the community of mathematicians and astronomers wrote most of the texts in Sanskrit, the Sanskrit of that time, and sometimes colored by the region. But the, most of the texts are in Sanskrit. Uh, even as late as 19th century, I believe there is a text from Orissa by a very well-known fine scholar. And Orissa by then was part of, of the British uh, British India. It was still in Sanskrit. As you probably know, the great traditional schools of learning in Kerala, for example, the famous one in Kodumelur, was active till 1930, 1930-1940 maybe. So most things are in Sanskrit. So that is not a major reason why we have lost uh, any knowledge. We may have lost manuscripts. But if you, you know, if you put them all together, if you look at all the things and try to find a continuity, try to find how ideas from a certain time influence what came later, I have the personal feeling that we haven't lost anything of great significance. That's what I feel. In the sense that we can actually reconstruct the flow of ideas from, let's say, Aribata onwards without serious difficulty. Listeners, we are in conversation with Professor P.P. Devakaran on the mathematical tradition of India. It is often observed that most modern mathematical and scientific thinking invariably traces its lineage to European and Greek thinkers over the centuries. What efforts do we need to make in your opinion so that Indian thoughts, ideas and thinkers find their rightful place for concepts originally articulated by them, perhaps much earlier than the European or Greek contemporaries? You know, these things are not done by deliberate action. It is not because some university or some government agency decides that we shall put Indian mathematics in the forefront, that Indian mathematics will come to the forefront. It will come when we have a community of scholars who are people of integrity, objective historians of the highest quality, unimpeachable objectivity in the way they look at their thing, not false pride. If we do that in course of time, of course it will not happen overnight because these are not easily... Uh, these customs and habits are not easily uh, changed. But uh, that is, in fact, the only way. Besides, that will make us better historians because, you know, just by insisting on objectivity, our understanding of reality, in the reality in which we live, will be better, and that's very good. Especially uh, the young people, we should concentrate on giving them an idea of India's achievements, uh, hiding none of the great achievements, in fact, playing them up but also not hiding things about which we need not be very proud. Uh, Vedic mathematics used to be very popular at one time. The fact is, Vedic mathematics is neither Vedic nor mathematics. Uh, the real Vedic mathematics is much tougher, much deeper, uh, very much more significant for the history of mathematics in the world. If you ask a typical university professor, let's say, who is not interested seriously in the history of mathematics, uh, he will, the first thing he has to tell you is, oh, you mean Vedic mathematics? I say, no, not the Vedic mathematics you mean. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a complex question. It is, uh, in my view, there is no miracle answer. You know, you've got to work at it. You've got to work on our educational system and so on and so forth. That's the way to, that's the way to make us feel 
what should I say, proud and objective at the same time about our achievements from the past. Can the world of innovation and technology benefit from the Indian tradition of mathematics? Ah, wonderful, very good. Actually, if you ask me, if you use the term mathematics in a slightly more general sense, uh, in the sense of including uh, what is sometimes these days called modern logic or mathematical logic, then I think it has already happened in the following sense. This, uh, applications of mathematics to technology or innovative sciences and so on and so forth, it happens in a very natural way. And generally what people use is in many fields in which uh, the mathematics from the 19th and the 18th century are very useful. For example, weather forecasting still depends on uh, mathematical methods as probably understood in the 19th century. However, the interesting thing is that uh, from the very ancient times, mathematical ideas of very ancient times are rarely ever useful in modern technology. There are some exceptions to this. For example, topology, coding, uh, encoding of uh, information, the uh, practice in using, you know, uh, internet transactions on banks and so on and so forth. They go back to certain elements of number theory which are very old. And uh, that number theory, Indians contributed very, very significantly. Uh, for example, the Brahmagupta. Brahmagupta, some of his work on what is called number theory is very directly relevant to this kind of thing. But more generally, as I said, if you include in the term mathematics, if you include mathematical logic, well, the first logician in the world, serious, active, rigorous uh, logician in the world is not a mathematician, he's a grammarian, a very famous grammarian called Panini. Panini, the foundation of Panini's work is a classification of all objects into certain sets, uh, and the, these sets are defined in a very, very modern way. That is to say, they're defined not by describing them, but by saying what they do, what their functions are, the elements of those sets, what their functions are. That is very much part of modern computer theory. Paninian methods are, in fact, in fact, there have been many conferences on the relevance of Panini's work on uh, modern information theory. So it's already happening. But lots of things will not be applicable because, you know, from our point of view, these things were great when they first took place, but they have been overtaken by modern uh, things. You know, Europe made tremendous progress beginning in the 17th century, uh, beginning with the Enlightenment in the sciences. The modern science is essentially European science that we cannot forget. But as my good friends working in these areas of philosophy and so on used to say, but the streams that went to make this river large must not be forgotten. We must know the history of this big, big river called modern science. So that's my answer to that question. Thanks a lot, Professor P.P. Devakaran, for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our website, newsonair.com. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks at gmail.com.